Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series, which is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project funded by the Exascale Computing Project in collaboration with the United States Department of Energy Computing Facilities at the Argo and Oak Ridge and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and will be the host for today's webinar, uh, uh, Quantitatively Assessing Performance Portability with Roofline. The webinar will be presented by John Pennycook from Intel and Charlene Young and Jack Deslip from NERSC, the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. John is an HPC application engineer in the uh, HPC ecosystem and applications team at Intel. He has a lot of experience in optimizing and parallelizing applications from a range of scientific domains. And he has a PhD in computer science from the University of Warwick in England. Charlene is an application performance specialist at NERSC, where she focuses on performance characterization, performance optimization, performance portability. She works with code teams in the NERSC XA Scale Science Application Program, and it helps uh, um, developers, users, to, to identify performance bottlenecks and also provides advice on optimization strategies. She holds a PhD degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of uh, Western Australia. Jack is the application performance group leader at NERSC. Uh, he and his group work with DOE application teams to evaluate and improve the performance of applications <coughs> of Cori and the future systems at NERSC as well. He also acts as a consultant to develop for material science applications on NERSC systems, and he received a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley. Um, all attendees have been muted. We'll be receiving questions through the WebEx chat and also the Google Doc. I have pasted those, uh, the link to that uh, Google Doc in the uh, Web WebEx chat. The webinar will have a break so the presenters can respond to the questions that uh, come in. So the webinar will start with Jack and then will be followed by John and then Charlene. Uh, so then Charlene, I'm gonna give you the share and uh, Jack, you can start. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, Osmi, for that introduction. Um, and, uh, I, I have to apologize to everybody. I have a bit of a cold, so if I am coughing or if I, I'm hard to understand, I apologize. Um, let's flip ahead to the next slide. So um, I want to just kind of talk briefly in order to motivate the discussion around quantitatively measuring performance portability. And I'm coming from a perspective of from, as somebody from the facility. So we're from, uh, Charlene and I are from NERSC, uh, which is the Mission HPC Center for the De Department of Energy Office of Science. And one of the things that's sort of unique about NERSC is that more so than really any other HPC facility, probably in the world, we have a very diverse set of users, projects, code, science areas, you know, people from different countries and states using the application. And so we kind of have a perspective of the, the broad scientific computing community and um, the, uh, the diversity in that, in that community. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and the challenge for us has really been how to enable NERSC's diverse community of those 7,000 users, 750 codes, to run on advanced architectures like Cori, which was a KNL architecture, and then Perlmutter, GPUs, and beyond, and do so productively. Um, and this is, this is a, a challenge that many, many other facilities face, but I think, you know, at NERSC is um, one of the places where the, the, the scientific community, the, the kind of rubber hits the road, and as the HPC community moves towards exascale. We want to make sure that that community does, sort of doesn't get left behind. Um, so as we deployed Cori a couple years ago, we realized that um, the, the challenge that the community is facing is, is, is substantial and that the system represented our first step on the way to exascale 
and kind of a, a, a change in the type of systems that we had pro procured for, you know, two decades before that. So, you know, with, with our previous procurements, the users could rely on the fact that their code with basically no modifications would run uh, faster on the new system, even on a node per node basis than the previous, uh, than whatever the previous generation system was. And we thought that for the first time that might not be true with, with Cori, um, that there are substantial architectural changes that people kind of need to, to think about um, and wrap their heads around. So for example, there's more parallelism in terms of the number of cores on the node. Uh, there's more parallelism with, uh, within those cores about how many operations they can do every cycle. There are changes in the memory hierarchy, including an addition of a small amount of fast memory. And we thought that this was, uh, you know, dif difficult enough that we kicked off a new activity to really engage users at a much deeper level than we had before. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? And with Perlmutter, there's um, uh, NERSC is continuing this uh, progression towards exascale energy efficient architectures. So we announced Perlmutter. Uh, in the fall, it'll be the next system that will arrive at NERSC in 2020. And this system will support a hybrid architecture where there's a number of CPU-only nodes with AMD EPIC um, processors that uh, uh, we think many of the optimizations are um, code teams made targeting K and L will make good use of. And then there'll additionally be some GPU accelerated nodes where a lot of the performance of the system will ultimately lie. And um, this provides some additional challenges, and in, in, in particular in terms of uh, providing a path to our users that is sort of seamless as they transition from Cori to Perlmutter and beyond. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Um, so one of the things that we've tried to do in order to scale our support for the community where we have over 750 apps running on our system is to come up with a way to frame the conversation around performance and around performance portability in a productive uh, way, that it's easy for users to understand, but it also gives kind of actionable information. <clears throat> and in particular, I think users are kind of need to know the following things. They need a sense of their absolute performance when optimizing applications. I've been to many presentations, and I've even given presentations myself where people will say something like, my code runs five times faster today than it did three years ago. And while that's in, in principle good, it, it really doesn't give you any sense of uh, where you stand in an absolute sense. It's kind of, it, it, it's kind of meaningless in, in that way. And so users need to, know how, need to know if their performance is good. They need to know like, why they're not getting peak, which directions they can move in. And most, partic most importantly, probably when to stop when they've reached kind of diminishing returns. And so they need to, you know, when you have an architecture like K&L or GPUs, there are multiple um, architectural features that may be limiting your performance. How do you know which potential optimization direction to apply and um, what is the limiting factor in your performance? And how to improve performance portability so users are scientists, they have accounts on many systems, they don't want to have to rewrite their code every two to three years as a new system is brought in. And so they want to think about um, uh, both the portability and longevity of their application. Um, can we move to the next slide? So we spent a lot of time trying to frame this conversation with our users in a way that would allow this broad scientific community to, to move forward. And, um, you know, we thought as we we're thinking about the optimization process for Cori, uh, we thought about different ways to talk about the process and we came up with some different analogies, like a staircase or a space elevator where you just make one change in your code and, it, and it's just the right change to make your code uh, just fly on the architecture or is it so complicated you can never, uh, you can never leave in terms of like a labyrinth. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And, you know, the, the kind of 
cartoon analogy that we came up with was, was that it was like an ant farm um, where you're constantly kind of running this lawnmower over your code to decide what the current bottleneck is. And then there's different things that you need to do to address that. Um, but let's go to the next slide. And really how this evolved over time was <coughs> uh, using the roof line model, which Charlene is going to kind of introduce later and talk about how you can use that to quantitatively um, visualize performance portability. But this started with us visualizing just performance and the optimization process. So here is the optimization for one of our applications, the warp code. And you can see that it's um, uh, that the performance of the code on, as plotted on the roofline curve is moving up in terms of total performance and also to the right in terms of arithmetic intensity or the data uh, reuse in the application. And as we prepared applications for Cori, we produced a number of these curves, and they're very satisfying, and they're particularly satisfying to the application developers themselves because it gives them a sense of one sort of achievement, you can actually visualize your improvement, but also a sense of kind of a deeper understanding of what the bottlenecks in your application are and ultimately an understanding of when to stop. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So we'd like to do the same thing with performance portability. We want to frame the performance portability um, process and questions in a way that um, can really benefit the scientific community. So I think everybody really kind of knows roughly what performance portability is. Um, but in order to make progress, I think it really pays to be precise and in particular quantifiable. And so here was the definition that NERSC in collaboration with Argonne Leadership Computing Facility and Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility came up with as a definition. And then really the point of the rest of the seminar is how do you go about measuring that? Um, and so the definition is that an application is performance portable if it achieves in a consistent ratio of actual time to solution to either the best known or the theoretical best time to solution on each platform with minimal platform code required. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. And let's talk about how you measure, how you quantify that now. And so there are many bad ways to do this, and some of these are, are, are sort of been used in practice, and that's just to compare the time to solution on one system to, to another. Um, that's obviously a bad thing to do because the systems could just have completely different capabilities. So the time to solution doesn't really represent any measure of portability. Another bad way is just to compare the ratio of, of actual app performance to uh, the peak system performance. And <clears throat> this is not a great idea because your application performance uh, might be limited by something that is not, you know, the, C the related to the max CPU frequency or the max CPU flop rate. It could be related to memory bandwidth or network bandwidth or something completely different. So we think good ways to measure performance portability are comparing time to solution on each system against some <coughs> well-known optimal implementation of the algorithm. Or two, compare the performance on each system against the rel a relevant roofline model ceiling on each system. And Charlene's going to talk a lot about that uh, just here in a minute. And we've included, in, uh, we have instructions available for how you do that on both the KNL and the GPUs. Um, so next slide. So um, I'm going to wrap up here. This might be a decent stopping point if there are any initial questions. Uh, and then um, John, I think, is going to take over on this slide. Is that right? Uh, Jack, I don't see any, any questions so far. So okay. I'm going to then give the uh, transfer the screen to John. Ready, John? OK. 
Okay, it hasn't worked. Give me one second. Okay, is that full screen now? Good. Okay. So just to reiterate what Jack has already said, um, I think when we talk about the three Ps, performance, portability, and productivity at kind of a very high level, it's very easy for us to agree on what they mean and what our goals are. So performance really means we want to run fast enough to enable scientific discovery. Portability means we want to support lots of different architectures, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and so on. And productivity really means that we want to minimize our effort in development and maintenance. And even when we start to combine these two, P, uh, two of these three Ps to make new terms like performance, portability, uh, it still makes sense and we still have an idea of what we mean. Performance and productivity would enable domain scientists to write high performance codes without spending a lot of time actually tuning those codes to get performance on one particular system. Performance portability would mean that your applications would run at all of the different facilities you care about uh, and still have good levels of performance. And portability and productivity would enable the developers to program in one shared language or programming model. So you wouldn't have to rewrite everything from scratch just because a new machine type comes along. And if we can all agree on what those goals mean, then we can probably also agree what an ideal application looks like. So ideally, our applications perform as well as possible. Uh, they run on all platforms, not just the ones that we know about today, but even the platforms that someone's going to propose in the future, so we don't have to rewrite things. And ideally, it requires very little effort or even no effort uh, to write new features or maintain existing features. But like Jack said, I think if we just have these very high level ideas, um, it's very difficult to actually assess how well we're doing as we develop our own applications. It's very difficult for us to say how close we are to those ideal applications. Um, we can't do things like compare different efforts. So if I, as a user, need to choose between two different libraries, so I've got two different candidate libraries so I could plug into my application, and I want to pick the one that is going to improve my performance portability the most, there's no standard methodology for that. Um, and also, like Jack was saying, we can't uh, set a development goal and decide when to stop. You can't say, I want to stop at 80% of this ideal application without some way of measuring how close you are to that ideal. So I want to point out that um, we're not looking to force our terminology or the metrics that we have proposed upon anybody, uh, but we have found them to be quite useful in guiding discussion with developers and refining what we actually mean by performance portability and what tools we we need to uh, to realize our goals. Uh, and we consider our work on performance portability to very much be a work in progress. So we welcome more feedback on the metric and we're looking for collaborators to uh, help us evaluate that metric on uh, new um, applications and help us develop new tools for measuring things and uh, and analyzing the results. Okay, so here is the metric itself. Um, we first proposed this a couple of years ago uh, in a workshop paper or in a journal paper. So that's myself and two other colleagues, Jason Sewell and Victor Lee. And what the maths here really says is that the performance portability metric is the harmonic mean of an application's performance efficiency on some set of platforms H for a particular input problem. And then there's a special case where we force the performance portability of an application to zero if it doesn't run correctly on any platform in the set. And that might seem a little harsh, but the basic idea is that you shouldn't be able to claim that your application is performance portable if you couldn't even claim that it was portable. And I'll come back to talk about what some of the other terms in these uh, definitions and metrics mean later on. But at the bottom of this slide, you can see there are three example graphs here. Um, and this is really just dummy data, so made up data to highlight how the performance portability metric works and uh, that we think it's, it's actually quite intuitive. So in the case of application one, you can see that the performance efficiency varies quite a lot with different platforms. And the performance portability metric acts as an average but because it's a, the harmonic mean, it tracks the minimum performance efficiency, which is platforms B and C. So it comes out at about 23%. And if you look at application two, 
uh, where all of the performance efficiencies are the same on all of the platforms, uh, your performance portability score is exactly the same number, it's 20%. And that's exactly what you would expect. And compared to application one, we think that most developers would prefer application one because uh, they would accept that uh, that slightly decreased performance efficiency on platforms B and C uh, as a trade-off so in exchange for the higher levels of performance efficiency on the other four platforms. And then application three shows something quite different again. So here we've got uh, five platforms with 80% performance efficiency and a single platform with 10% performance efficiency. And again, as I said, the harmonic mean pulls uh, pulls things down. So the presence of platform E in the platform set uh, means that instead of an 80% performance efficiency, uh, sorry, performance portability, you get 37%. Uh, and this is interesting for a couple of reasons. So from a user perspective, it shows that actually computing performance portability relative to a set of platforms that you care about is actually really important. So if you knew that you needed to support platform E, then the performance portability is 37%. If you know that platform E is a platform you don't care about, it's something you're never gonna buy or it's not available at your facility, uh, then you can actually remove platform E from your platform set, recompute performance portability and end up with a score of 80%. But as a developer, looking at all of these uh, platforms and the resulting performance portability score, I might encourage you to either report that your performance portable only across the platforms that you truly support, so you don't make misleading claims, uh, or you decide that you want to include E in your platform set and focus your development effort there. Okay, and so the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about some of the other terminology in the metric and definition. So when we say application, we really mean anything that can accept the input problem and produce some output. And that seems a little fuzzy and vague, um, but it's deliberate because we want to allow for an application to be something as simple as a, a shell script um, or a library API that actually calls out to different applications on different platforms. So as an example, um, consider like a, a BLAST library that makes calls to either MKL or Kublas, depending on whether it's running on an Intel CPU or an NVIDIA GPU. Well, the performance portability of that high level library interface is higher than the performance portability of MKL or Kublas on their own. And the reason that we account for input problem as an input to the metric is that anytime you change the input problem, uh, you'll be sending potentially the code down very different paths. Uh, and in extreme cases, there may even be some features of an application that haven't yet been ported or enabled um, on a particular platform. So any of these things could impact performance uh, and that could impact your performance portability. So by varying the application and problem, uh, we can start to answer interesting questions like which of these applications has the highest performance portability for the problem I care about. So that's how you would choose between different libraries uh, or different software packages. You can ask whether the, the performance portability of your application is actually consistent across different input problems. Maybe that's something that you want, uh, you want to aim for. Um, and you can also look at the impact of some code transformation on your performance portability. So this is the way that you start to be able to track performance portability over time. And then what are platforms and what is this platform set H? Well, a platform is everything that makes up your execution environment. So that's hardware uh, and all the software, the operating system, the compiler, all of the runtime tools, all of the compiler flags, anything that happened to be running at the same time when you uh, actually took your performance measurement, uh, any environment variables, thread affinities, everything. And that's because any of those things could impact performance and then impact your performance portability. But we place no restriction on what platforms can actually be used in a platform set. And that may seem a little odd because it does mean that you can compute the performance portability of a single platform. It's just the performance efficiency of that platform. Uh, and you can also um, look at the performance portability for sets of platforms that seem quite similar. So you don't have to compute the performance portability of uh, across say CPUs and GPUs. You could look at the performance portability 
uh, across a set of just CPUs. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So changing the platforms, we can answer questions like, what is the performance portability of my application uh, on the platforms that I care about, the ones that are available in this cluster or the ones available at my facility, uh, all the facilities that I have access to. We can look at whether a given application is more performance portable across platforms of specific types. So in a previous publication, we looked at um, taking the performance portability across just CPUs and the performance portability across just GPUs. And then as a third set, looking at the performance portability uh, of CPUs and GPUs. And what that highlighted was that the applications we were looking at um, in some cases had uh, an affinity for GPUs. Uh, you can test assertions from framework developers that their framework provides a certain level of performance portability uh, between platforms of certain types. Um, and you can look at the performance portability of an application across uh, things like different generations or even different SKUs of one architecture. So for example, moving from uh, Haswell to Broadwell to Skylake. And the reason you might want to do that might not be immediately clear. Uh, but let's say you are developing a cache oblivious algorithm. Uh, so one way that you can test that your uh, algorithm is working, it's truly cache oblivious and it's providing performance benefits in the manner that you expect, would be to look at the performance portability of that application when moving between CPUs with different cache sizes. Okay, and then the final term that I want to talk about uh, is this performance efficiency. So in the paper, we talk about two different types of performance efficiency. One is uh, architectural efficiency, and this represents how well an application utilizes each platform's resources. You can think of it as uh, being very similar to percentage of peak or percentage of, uh, of performance relative to the roof line. And then application efficiency, uh, slightly different. It represents whether an application uses appropriate algorithms on each platform. And rather than being a ratio to uh, theoretical peak performance, it's a ratio to uh, the best known performance. So this is the uh, best performance that's been demonstrated by anybody for your application or something solving the same problem uh, on the same platform. And both of these efficiencies have shortcomings. So uh, we actually suggest that where possible, it's best to uh, calculate and present them both. Um, because, for example, if you have an architectural efficiency of 100%, that doesn't actually mean that your uh, application can't run any faster. It simply means that you've hit some ceiling somewhere um, and your code is bottlenecked by something. If you could find some way to alleviate uh, that bottleneck, either through um, you know, algorithmic change, so something like uh, switching from merge sort to radix sort, or even just doing something like cache blocking, uh, you could find yourself running much faster, even though you were previous, uh, previously at 100% efficiency. And something similar can happen with application efficiency. So if you're running at 100% application efficiency, that just means that you are currently performing at the best known level of performance. Um, people come up with new algorithms all the time, so that could change. Uh, or it could just be that when you look at your application efficiency in conjunction with architectural efficiency, you realize that there's still some more tuning work for you to do. So we recommend that you uh, present them both where possible. Okay, and now we've gone through what the metric means and uh, what all of the terms mean, we can start to look at some results. So here's a case study uh, for the Babelstream benchmark developed at the University of Bristol. And Babelstream is uh, basically McAlpin's stream triad benchmark but rewritten in several different uh, languages and frameworks as a means of looking into performance portability, but also to enable uh, stream uh, triad bandwidth to be computed for lots of different platforms that McAlpin's code doesn't run on. Um, and I should point out that this is historical data. So I've got data from 2016 and 2017. So if you were to rerun these experiments, you might get different results because of changes in configuration, security patches, things like that. Uh, but I'm not really highlighting the absolute performance here, rather the trends. So what I want to point out first is that if you look at the McAlpin, Sickle, and CUDA implementations of Babelstream, 
Uh, in 2016, all three of those had a performance portability score of zero. And that represents that uh, there was at least one platform in the set of platforms that Bristol tested where those implementations didn't run or didn't run correctly. In all the other cases, uh, you can see that the performance efficiency is actually quite good and the performance portability score comes out at about 80% uh, for Raja Cocos and OpenMP and 60% for OpenATC and OpenCL. And if you look behind the lines at the blue and yellow bars, then you can see the reason that those efficiencies aren't higher is that typically the GPU efficiencies are quite high, uh, in some cases even very close to 100%, but the CPU efficiencies are low, and so the metric is being pulled down by those. And if we jump ahead to 2017, then what you can see, uh, I think the most striking result is that the sickle performance portability jumps from zero to 70%, and that represents that in that time period, SQL runtimes and compilers uh, improved to the point that Bristol were able to run their SQL implementation on all of the platforms tested. But if you look at Raja, Cocos, OpenMP, and OpenCL, the performance portability increased um, by about 10% in all four cases, I think. Um, and this is because Bristol went and focused their development efforts on improving uh, the CPU performance doing things like making sure that the code vectorized um, and making sure they were using non-temporal stores where appropriate. Okay, so finally I want to talk a little bit about ways you could fool people using the metric, so ways not to use the metric essentially. So first, we think that performance portability is a measurable property of an application, so you shouldn't use it to compare platforms or frameworks unless you have lots and lots of data from lots and lots of applications and you're taking an average or something like that. Uh, we've seen that changing the platform set can have a significant impact on the performance portability score. Uh, so comparing portability across different sets of platforms is not useful, it's meaningless. Uh, because it would be very easy for someone to add a platform that they knew wasn't supported and force the performance portability score to zero. Uh, a performance portability score is only as good as the uh, performance baseline that it's based on. So it would be very easy to say, well, the best known performance is my own performance, so I've got a performance portability of 100%. Uh, and that's great, but it doesn't tell you anything. Um, Similarly, problem parameters like size or floating point precision, uh, all of those things will impact performance. So uh, you need to make sure that you do an apples to apples comparison, just the same as you would with any uh, performance comparison. And then finally, because our definition of platform uh, allows for um, the user to set what a platform is, uh, it's very easy for people to, to make uh, these very grand claims, uh, like my code is performance portable across 100 platforms. And that's only impressive if those 100 platforms are not just the same, uh, the same architecture with slightly different SKUs and slightly different operating system versions. That data might be useful, but it may not be telling you what you think it's telling you. And I want to highlight this third point. Uh, because Charlene is now going to talk about uh, a methodology for ensuring that you pick a good performance baseline so as not to skew uh, any performance portability metric you compute. So John, um, before uh, we move to Charlene's uh, part, uh, there are a couple of questions here that I'm going to go through. Okay. So the first one was actually, uh, this. the question came in just after Jack um, finished. But do you have benchmark applications that do nothing important, but have measurable tasks? Would you take that or pass it back to Jack? Uh, I think pass that back to Jack. Hey, Jack. Could you read the question one more time? Do you have benchmark applications that do nothing important, but have measurable tasks? Um that do nothing important but have measurable tasks. Uh, I think, I mean, I think that's sort of the, that, that sort of describes any benchmark suite to my, uh, 
in my understanding of, you know, a benchmark is something that doesn't really compute real science, but has uh, things that are measurable. So we uh, use a number of micro benchmarks like stream and uh, Winpack and a number of MPI benchmarks to, to benchmark certain aspects of the architect of the system. And we also have a set of benchmark suites that we use, uh, benchmarks that we use for um, procurements and that we use to consistently measure the performance on the system. Those uh, are based on real applications. So we have like a mini DFT application, uh, a QCD application that we use, and about uh, you know six or seven in total that we use to kind of benchmark systems and um, and uh, are used for kind of procurement and also for performance variability over time. But I, I have a feeling I didn't quite grasp the implication of the question. Well, so then you'll have a chance later, Jack, to answer this, you know, think about it and answer, uh, uh, you know, before we publish it, okay? So now a uh, question for you, John, uh, how are these concepts, also the roof line model, extended to include internode performance and how do you practically address this? Okay, that's a good question. So uh, we haven't looked at our performance portability metric in the context of multiple nodes, really. We, we tend to focus on single node performance. Um, I think in theory, it should be possible to extend the definition of platform to talk about a platform being a cluster um, or a platform being a certain number of nodes, for instance. So you could talk about the performance portability of an application when run at a, a particular scale, uh, but it isn't something we've done. So that, that's really just, um, just a guess at, at how it could be used. Uh, we'd be very interested in, in trying to evaluate that if someone has a code that they're interested in, uh, in working on that with us. Um, as, for roofline, uh, I'm not sure about that one. I think maybe Charlene has a has an answer about that. Okay, Charlene. So I'm uh, giving you now the the screen. Okay. Okay. Um, but just to follow on the last question, um, I think roofline is um, essentially focused on all node performance as well, um, but like John said, I think it's possible to um, extend that to uh, cover multi-node applications. You can share your screen now. Yep. Okay. Um, so following on um, what Jack and John have talked about, uh, I'm going to focus on just one term uh, in the metric, uh, the architectural efficiency, and how to use roofline to calculate this and how to make it more accurate. So um, there are roughly three messages I want to get across uh, in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so first is to use empirical feelings in the roofline analysis. Uh, second is to uh, um, uh, to account for complex instructions like divides, um, exponentials, and, and such um, in the flops counting. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, what the difference is if you don't count it appropriately. Um, and then um, uh, with a few examples, I'm going to show you how roofline can capture uh, different nuances in um, performance analysis. And um, all of these um, is to um, um, make sure that you know, your calculation of architectural efficiency is accurate and your uh, performance portability score is accurate. So um, if anybody has never heard of roofline. Uh, this is a 20 second intro. Um, so when you think about uh, performance bounds, um, you may be thinking about you know, the peak flops. Um, and 
uh, that may not be true always. Um, and um, here, an example would be, you know, when your code is bandwidth bound, in that case, uh, you'd never reach the peak float. So um, what Ruth Line says is that uh, you're bound by the combination of the two. Um, so when you're in a bandwidth bound region, you're bound by uh, the product of uh, the peak bandwidth and uh, the arithmetic intensity of your code on this platform. And then um, if you're in the compute band region, you're bound by the peak flops. Um, so the, um, uh, the plot is log-log scale. Uh, it's designed in this way so that uh, it's easier to extrapolate when you have, say, double the flops or double the bandwidth, uh, what happens with the performance. Uh, and of course, you can have multiple uh, bandwidth lines or um, peak flops lines, depending on if you're running, say, um, a vector um, code or a scalar, um, heavily a scalar code, uh, or if you're looking at different uh, memory levels. Um, so how to collect roofline data? Um, here we uh, strongly recommend people to use uh, ERT to uh, measure uh, these feelings uh, empirically. And uh, to get the ap application data, um, uh, in this talk, um, uh, for the experiments in this talk, I have used SDE Liquid um, on KNL and MVPROF on um, NVIDIA Volta GPUs. Um, so the, um, the raw measurements you have to collect are mainly three. Um, first is the flops, which is uh, the total number of floating point operations. And then uh, the data movement uh, in bytes. And then the runtime. Um, and with these uh, three data um, entries, we can calculate the um, X coordinate, Y coordinate of this uh, dot. So one is the arithmetic intensity uh, in flops per byte, and then uh, the uh, gigaflops per second performance. Um, then with all the data collected, uh, you could you know, plot them up uh, onto a single graph like this. Um, you could use, so here I have a simple, simple uh, example um, using Python. So you could try this and then uh, have an input file like this uh, to plot everything up. Um, and uh, you could also use, you know, uh, GNU plot or some other tools. Uh, it's really up to you. And so starting with message one, um, so um, there's a di discrepancy between the um, empirical ceilings and the theoretical ceilings. And we hear a lot about uh, you know, the specifications from vendors, um, say, 3 teraflops on Aquino or 7.8 on Volta uh, V100. Um, but um, that's probably not taking um, taking into account, say, the, um, the power constraint or some specific clock frequencies you're running at. Um, for example, on um, KNL, if you're running a full AVX code, uh, your uh, frequency could be dropped by 200 megahertz. And um, the, uh, the three teraflops um, marketed that's probably not um, considering uh, this frequency drop. Um, so with ERT, uh, you can um, uh, get a more realistic sense of uh, what the peaks should be. And here I'm showing about 10%, um, up to 30% um, difference uh, between the 
empirical ceilings and the theoretical ceilings. Um, the second message uh, is about uh, complex instructions. Um, so we know that additions, multiplications are counted as one flop each, um, but um, operations like divides, exponentials, or logarithms, um, they are actually implemented by multiple instructions. And it's not fair to just count them as one flop. And here uh, we're going to do uh, some comparison. So one is the um, canonical way of counting the flops, and the other one is the empirical way. Um, so the example we're going to use is the, the GPP kernel from uh, Berkeley GW, uh, which is a material science code. Um, so, the, so in the box here uh, is the, the pseudocode of GPP. Um, you can see it's made up of um, uh, a few loops nested together, and um, there are some reductions. Uh, what you can't see is in the um, compute uh, section, there are some divides. Uh, some FMA instructions, but not all of the instructions are FMA. Um, the data type uh, is com complex double. Um, so um, why we chose GPP uh, is because um, it's highly parameterizable, um, so you can tweak certain parameters in the in the kernel. For example, you can uh, tweak this number here, NW, um, to change uh, the total number of iterations in this loop. And um, because the total data movement is not going to change, um, but the flops will, and so the arithmetic intensity will change. Um, but that's just one of the examples um, of the different variants of GPP. Uh, we're going to use more of the, the different vari variants of GPP, so I'm going to talk about that later. But um, here to um, just compare the, the different um, ways of counting flops, um, if we change NW um, on two different platforms, you can see that at a higher NW value, the difference can be as high as 35%, and um, that, that's not uh, negligible. And if we look at the performance, um, because the, um, the data movement uh, hasn't changed, um, but the slots has gone up, and so the arithmetic intensity um, has increased, and so has the gigaflops per second performance. So here, um, if you look at the, the different dots on two platforms, um, both dots and the, so we compiled the code with FMA and without FMA, um, and we compared the canonical um, performance, which is using the canonical flops, and the empirical performance. You can see that both performance dots have moved uh, up and to the right. So um, the message here is that um, so you may be closer to the ceiling than you think you are, and you could also be in a different uh, regime on Roofline. So maybe here you think, um, maybe on the Volta GPU, uh, you think you're bandwidth bound, but uh, you're probably more compute bound. Um, so that's the second message. Um, the third one is about uh, the different capabilities of Roofline and how it can be used in performance analysis and performance portability analysis. Um, so here we're going to use a few uh, variants of GPP. Uh, first, we're going to change uh, the value of NW uh, in order to change the arithmetic intensity. 
Um, secondly, we're going to compile the code uh, with FMA and then without. Um, and last, we're going to change uh, the memory access pattern. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, so to do this uh, striding, so we're going to look at strided memory access patterns. Uh, we're going to break this IG loop into two loops. So one is controlling um, the stride size, and the other one is you know, going around, still picking up different elements, but at a stride. Uh, so an example is uh, stride two, and you can see each element is not um, accessing um, contiguous memory anymore. It's jumping uh, two elements at a time. So um, with these three different um, uh, variants of GPV, or three different benchmarks, um, we're going to run them on two different platforms, and we're going to calculate the architectural efficiency on two different platforms, and this is using uh, Roofline. And then we're going to plug this number um, on two platforms into the metric that John has talked about and calculate the um, performance portability score. So um, starting with the, two, the first two uh, benchmarks, um, as we increase um, NW, um, we can see that the arithmetic intensity is growing, uh, so is the performance. But um, on both platforms, the performance seems to be capped at uh, some point. Um, and if we look at the FMA performance, so this is the FMA, the solid symbols, uh, the FMA curve, um, when it's converged, um, it's very far from the FMA ceiling, whereas the no FMA uh, curve, uh, it's actually getting very close to the no FMA ceiling. Uh, so, and the reason for that is simply um, that we don't have enough FMA instructions in the code. Um, so apart from you know the lack of FMA instructions, we are getting very close to the you know, FMA peak. Um, but if we look at um, the converged you no know, FMA performance, uh, the gap between the performance and the ceiling, and um, the gap here, uh, you can see that uh, the gap on K now is a bit bigger than on C100, and the reason is that um, and the different um, instruction issue bandwidth and different uh, instruction uh, execution bandwidth. So on K now you can issue two instructions per cycle and you can execute uh, two instructions per cycle. Um, on V100 you can uh, issue four warps um, per cycle and you can execute one warp. So here we're talking about uh, double precision um, operations. So uh, just, there are only 32 FP64 cores, so you can only execute one warp um, uh, per cycle. Um, and so you can see the difference between the, the issue bandwidth and the execution bandwidth. Um, apart from, well, in order to do the floating point operations, we have to have you know some integer operations or some memory uh, related instructions um, that have to happen, and they do take um, they do take up place in the uh, you know the pipeline. So um, if you have some room uh, between the issue bandwidth and the execution bandwidth, then uh, you are more likely. Um, it's easier for you to achieve the, the no FMA um, ceiling. So um, from, from Roofline, you can see this subtlety uh, between different architectures. 
and I guess this is you know part of the message that uh, Riffline can be very powerful um, in capturing this. And um, so um, with these um, dots, we can calculate uh, different uh, architectural efficiencies, and then we can uh, use the metric um, proposed by uh, John and a few others at Intel to uh, calculate a performance portability score. So um, you can see for the um, no FMA performance portability score, uh, it's almost always above 80%. Um, then that means you know your um, performance efficiency is almost is almost always above 80% um, on both platforms um, across different um, AIs, um, and that's understandable. Um, and for FMA, um, because we don't have enough FMA uh, instructions in the kernel at high AI um, values. Uh, we are, you know, um, the architectural efficiency is dropping, and so is the uh, the performance portability score. So, um, I guess uh, the message here is that the score is effective in measuring how um, consistent um, performance efficiencies are across different uh, platforms. And then the last one is about um, uh, strided memory access um, patterns. And as we increase the stride size, you can see um, the dots are moving from the right to the left. And they're getting you know, um, aligned with the HBM bandwidth. Um, and they are moving, but they will stop at some point uh, at a certain stride size. Um, and that's because you know, you're getting close to almost random um, memory access patterns. And um, that makes sense, right? Um, so again, uh, we, we calculated the different architectural efficiencies and the uh, performance portability. So the score is uh, going up as we uh, increase the stride size. And that just means, you know, um, GPP is um, becoming more and more uh, bandwidth bound um, very consistently on both architectures. Um, and you might think, you know, the performance is actually dropping um, from here to here, but um, the bound is also changing. So when you calculate uh, the architectural efficiency, you're calculating against the relevant bound, not the peak, uh, the compute peak. Um, so um, here we actually see an increase uh, in the architectural efficiency. And so um, on the uh, performance portability score as well. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to summarize our talk. Um, so um, Jack has um, talked about why performance portability is important, the past attempts to define it or to uh, quantify it. And then John talked about the metric that they have proposed. And um, I have shown how Roofline can be used in uh, performance analysis, performance portability analysis. Um, I've shown how um, the metric that John has proposed uh, is very um, effective. And um, um, lastly, I would like to stress um, that um, it's very important to use empirical uh, roofline ceilings in these analyses, and it's very important to um, count accurately count flops for instructions like divides, and also comparing relevant comparing performance to uh, relevant ceilings um, instead of just the um, peak flops. Um, so that was uh, my talk and a few references.
Thank you, Charlene. And I have a couple of questions here for you. Okay. So the first one, um, in practice, how to uh, how do you measure empirical flops and canonical flops with regard to properly accounts for divides? Okay. Um, so here when we talk about the canonical uh, counting of flops, um, we're um, we're using we're tweaking GPP so that uh, it doesn't have divides. So we're replacing divides with uh, multiplies. Um, that doesn't make sense in a um, scientific research uh, way, um, but it, it gives us the you know canonical plots for the whole kernel. Um, so we still use um, SDE to count the, the total number of flops. Um, in that case, so I think then, it would be good to schedule like a follow up conversation. That would be I'm sorry. No, nothing. Go ahead. Okay, and then the empirical way is just you know when GPP is in its natural state, uh, we have a certain number of uh, divides, and then we use SDE to count those flops. So when I mean canonical. Um, you, you can count um, the flops by just counting, um, by manually counting um, the total number of flops, um, and then counting each divide as one flop. So another question here, in how, f uh, how far is it um, useful to talk about achieving roughly 100% performance portability when not using the optimal algorithm setup? The optimal algorithm or setup uh, with respect to the strided access, for example. Um, so I guess the metric um, gives you a sense of consistent consistency, performance consistency across um, different platforms, but it doesn't say, you know, the flaws, the actual, the absolute. Um, gigaflops per second um, for that particular application. Maybe John wants to um, chime yeah, in. Yeah, so I, I think this is a good example of a case where um, having both an architectural efficiency and an application efficiency can be useful because the architectural efficiency reflects the fact that you are bound by something. So having 100% of performance portability uh, in terms of architectural efficiency means that you are consistently hitting the same bound across all uh, the platforms in the set. But then looking at your application efficiency, um, in addition to that, would highlight the fact that the other strides uh, achieve a higher level of performance. Um, so looking at those two numbers, you would be able to draw that conclusion, right? If if they were both 100%, then that would mean that you were bound by uh, some bottleneck on all platforms, um, and you were getting the best performance possible. If one of them is 100% and the other isn't, then that imbalance gives you uh, reason to follow up. Final question here, um, Charlene. Do you have a special treatment for zero operations when computing the performance efficiency? Example, on the GPU, you are using batch at DGEM by padding all matrices, uh, which is not plus than uh, more than 90% zero operations, but it's still very fast, which is very close to peak bandwidth and peak performance. On the CPU, we don't have batch DGEMs, quite far from offline. So, um let me let me understand this first um zero operations um well if you'd like you could think about it and write and answer later because just for the yeah. sake of time here okay cool so let me see here the, the last one here when adding the bandwidth for level one and two caches to a roof line model for gpus should we use the cumulative bandwidth of all the left lu one and two caches on all the multiprocessors or just for a single multiprocessor um well you can do either but you have to consistent across 
you know, all the cash levels. So on the same roof line, if you're just looking at one single multiprocessor, you probably should, you know, measure all the data movement or all the um, arithmetic intensity or the bandwidth just for one particular um, multiprocessor. But I think it's very hard to do that. Um, L2 is shared across all the um, the SMs. Um, so I guess what I would do it is to measure the cumulative um, data, data movement and everything else. Uh, let's see here, Charlene. I think that was the last question. Okay. And just for the sake of time here, so I'm present. I'm showing uh, already announcing the uh, next webinar which is going to be on the February 13 containers for HPC. This is going to present by Shane Cannon. Uh, you can already register for it. Uh, so uh, please send us feedback about uh, this webinar. So there is a link there. Ideas bit.ly ideas per uh, survey. Uh, the slides and recording will be available uh, sometime next week. Also, uh, the, we'll ask the speakers, the presenters, to go through um, the questions and, and answers and, uh, and create those. And uh, there is one question that I think Charlene will think a little more about it. Uh, so if you have anything else to say, Charlene and John, otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I'm going to see you uh, in February. Charlene and, and John, do you have a final? <laughs> um, no, I'm good. No, nothing for me. Yeah. Thanks for organizing. Yeah. Sure. So, so thank you, everybody.